When using a computer, one of the most important functions it can perform is to store the data you create. Without the capacity for long-term storage, anything left in the RAM would magically disappear when the power cycles. What makes non-volatile storage different than many other components of a computer is that, while things like processors and RAM stay fundamentally the same between generations, storage devices come in many different forms, some of which coexisted on machines. Before I get all into the history of this, however, note that this video isn't going to cover every type of data storage that existed for computers. There are plenty of old ones for the mainframes, as well as some obscure and short-lived ones, which could make this video go on forever. Instead, I'll be going over some of the more common methods for home computers and consoles. Going back to some of the early home computers, such as the ZX Spectrum, most of the work done on them was simply playing small games that could fill their limited memories. Most likely, all you would ever be using storage for would be to load software into the computer. Because of that, a cheap and easy solution was to encode the program as a series of tones on a cassette tape. After playing the tape from any old tape player, the computer would have the program stored into RAM. Theoretically, a standard cassette could hold about 1.32 megabytes of data. In practice, however, it was much less, being that most computers of the time could only hold a few kilobytes in RAM, and to retrieve that much data from the tape, you would need to play it for about an hour and a half. As a visual analogy, if one gallon were to equate to one gigabyte, the amount of data a cassette could hold would be about one third of a tablespoon. Some of the major flaws of the cassette, however, were that it wasn't very reliable, often requiring multiple attempts to load a program. It was slow to load data, and it could only be played in one way. As time went on, a new device came to resolve these issues. The one, the only, and the iconic floppy disk. You know, the save icon. Floppy disks, simply put, are a thin and flexible magnetic ring inside a plastic casing. By magnetizing different parts of the disk, called sectors, and pulsating patterns, you could retrieve the data later by detecting these magnetic traces. It works kind of like a strange combination between a turntable and a cassette tape, I suppose. The floppy disk came in many different forms, each evolving over the last. The first one to become commonplace was the 5 quarter inch floppy. With a mass of 400 kilobytes of storage available, it is also the reason we call them floppy disks. Unfortunately, due to the size and the fragile inner disk, the 5.25 inch floppies were easily breakable and rather loud. Thankfully, the successor to the original floppy, the 800 kilobyte 3.5 inch floppy came, which was no longer floppy, but still protected the inner disk. Its smaller size also led to much quieter operation, as well as being a much better construction material. Well, not really. Finally, it was the 1.44 megabyte high density floppy disk, which despite the hole in one corner was visually identical to the previous disk. After those main three came a barrage of different types, which held much more data, but never caught on due to the excess of formats. Also evolving around the same time on consoles was the cartridge. Starting on the Magnavox Odyssey is nothing more than a few connections on a PCB that you would plug into the console. Cartridges quickly moved on to include a ROM chip, which in some cases could hold up to 64 megabytes in some games in the mid-90s. What makes cartridges truly unique from all other forms of storage in this list is that they could include custom components for each game. A fairly common one was battery-powered RAM to save progress in longer games, but some games such as Star Fox on the Super Nintendo went as far as to include a graphics coprocessor in them. Some peripherals, such as the failed 32X, actually used the cartridge slot as a means of I.O. to the console. This functionality, along with the fast loading times due to them being purely electronic devices, made cartridges favorable for years. Eventually, however, a new competitor to cartridges rose out of a need for more memory. Thus came the CD. Originally released in 1982 by a joint effort of Sony and Philips engineers, it wasn't long before some people realized that the 700 megabytes of storage available could be useful for something other than just audio. Eventually, some unsuccessful consoles and some very successful consoles were released with not a cartridge slot, but a CD reader. This proved to create competition between the original PlayStation and the Nintendo 64, which chose to remain with cartridges. Nintendo argued that cartridges were faster and simpler, despite the fact cartridges held less than one-tenth of what a CD could hold, and were much more expensive to produce. It wouldn't be until the GameCube that Nintendo finally adopted an optical format, albeit a proprietary one. Around the time these consoles were being released, a newer high-density format was released, which could hold even more data thanks to a shorter wavelength laser being used. 
Visually identical to the CD, the DVD could hold 4.7 GB in its most common form. That's nearly as much data as 7 CDs. To go even further with this visual analogy, compared to a DVD, a 5.25 inch floppy is quite literally the drop in the bucket. What all this storage capability meant was more complicated models and higher resolution textures that could take better advantage of the more powerful hardware. The most recent competitor to the DVD to date is the Blu-ray disc. Using an even shorter wavelength laser than the DVD, the Blu-ray can store up to about 50 gigabytes or almost 11 DVDs worth of data. While DVDs were adopted very quickly, Blu-rays are still not very commonplace for personal computers. Consoles, however, are a different story. The PS3 used Blu-rays as a means of data retrieval since its launch around the time of the release of the Blu-ray itself in 2006. Across nearly all of this time, internal storage was available for computers, although it was typically more expensive than the removable storage options like floppies. However, now, due to its convenience, the hard drive is pretty ubiquitous when it comes to digital devices. Because of its long history, it's hard to assign an actual limit to the capacity of the hard drive. Fundamentally the same as a floppy disk using magnetism stored on a rotating disk, hard drives are finding themselves being replaced by a superior option, that being flash memory, or solid state drives. More similar to a cartridge, SSDs use purely electronic methods to store data. This allows them to be much faster than their physical counterparts, able to read from two different locations without needing to wait for a drive head to move. With no moving parts, they are silent and less likely to lose data from an impact, making them ideal for mobile devices. The only problem facing SSDs at the current moment is that they cost more per gigabyte than an HDD. Storage concerns may be less of an issue to the end user, however, with the rise of the internet. A recent estimate of the size of the internet showed it to be about 1.2 billion gigabytes. Going back to the water analogy, that would be about the same as taking the Great Pyramid of Giza, flipping it upside down, filling it with water, and still having enough left to almost fill it again. And that's just the internet size now. With a near infinite capacity for growth, we may find all of our data residing in the cloud on a server somewhere as opposed to on our actual machine. This already happens with applications such as Google Docs and Steam, where no physical media even touches your computer when you buy new software. With the benefits of having a wealth of data at your disposal nearly anywhere you go, as well as easy ways to share all of that data, cloud may be the future of data storage as we know it. With all of these benefits, however, come some frightening drawbacks. The threat of losing your data due to faulty internet connections, the company hosting your data going under, as well as hackers vandalizing it is something to keep in mind. Fortunately, some of these services, such as Google Docs, keep periodic backups to help users retrieve lost data due to vandalism or even human error, as well as allow you to download the files to your own computer as your own backup. It's hard to say what formats may come next, if at all, to store data in. As storage becomes more abstracted from the users, we may find ourselves with no actual direct interaction with data storage devices anymore, but whatever the future brings, it will surely be an improvement over the floppy disk. Though I suppose that wouldn't be very hard.